Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm here today with Oregon OSHA Senior Safety Enforcement Officer, Mr. Tom Meyer. Tom, thank you for your time and expertise today as we are here to review the hazards and control measures related to oxyfuel welding and cutting. Mm -hmm. Can you please provide a little more about you, Tom? Time with Oregon OSHA as well as prior to Oregon OSHA, time spent in the industry? I've been with Oregon OSHA since 2007, about uh, 12 and a half years now, uh, as a senior safety compliance officer. Uh, prior to here, I was in the compressed gas industry for approximately 29 and a half years. Uh, my primary duties were managing uh, compressed gas plants that filled compressed gas cylinders and delivered compressed gas cylinders. And so that's where, and also in the settling plant, that's where I've gained my expertise in and around compressed gas. Thank you, Tom. We'd also like to extend our appreciation today to Airgas here in Tigard, Oregon, for opening their doors to us and allowing us to film in their facility. Thank you to Gary, Terry, and Kenneth here at Airgas for making this happen. We truly appreciate it. So the purpose of this video is to provide a brief overview of Oregon OSHA's gas cutting and welding rules found in both Oregon OSHA's Division II Subpart Q and Division III Subpart J, rules for both general industry and construction. Tom will also share many best practices and concerns that he has addressed over the years he has been inspecting various workplaces. But first, Tom, can you please review some general precautions that should be taken prior to any welding, whether it's oxy fuel or even electric welding? What are some of the general precautions or general requirements that we would mm -hmm. expect an employer to follow before any welding or cutting is done? Yeah, uh, in the rules uh, just before the oxygen fuel gas rule, we have general precautions that should be taken. Uh, things such as designated work areas, which we'll also mention in the oxy fuel gas rule. Mm -hmm. uh, but in those designated areas, things such as removal of combustibles, fire watches set up, uh, fire extinguishers available, uh, they've looked at the area to make sure they've eliminated any potential trip hazards that could be created in the, in the work area. Uh, also, uh, um, some general things are addressed such as cutting on containers to make sure that they are properly purged and cleaned so that there's no reaction from the torch assembly, the flame, with any reactive material in that drum or container that someone is cutting on. Mm -hmm. Confined spaces is reviewed there, which talks about, of course, you never take cylinders into a confined space and use them. They're always outside the confined space. Uh, you'll also see things related to eye protection, uh, filtered lenses of different degree to protect the welder's eyes from, from the arc flash uh, that's created in the process. Okay. Right. Um, and then there's welding screens, and these are both help welders in the area where there could be multiple welding areas, cutting areas, but also people from the front office or other areas that walk out into the facility that could be subjected to an arc flash. And, and uh, so it talks about that. Also other PPE, such as gloves, leathers, hearing protection. Um, did the employer conduct a hazard assessment of the workplace to identify that PPE? And then also ventilation and respiratory protection because in the welding process is using different uh, welding wires, metals with the flux coating, uh, you create vapors and smoke. And so is there ventilation for that or do the employees need to wear respiratory protection of some type or form? Um, so those are general precautions that come yep. right before the area of the, of the Q rule 2253 on oxy fuel gas welding. So some of the very important general requirements as it pertains to all welding and cutting. Thank you, Tom. But before we get into the specifics of oxy fuel cutting and welding, it seems like when we're talking compressed gases, hazards abound. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, when you think of the hazards coming from compressed gases, compressed gas cylinders, uh, what comes to your mind? Well, the hazards that come to my mind uh, in that type of a work area is right away pressure. The most common hazard we have with any cylinder process is the pressure that's in that cylinder and the potential exposure of the employee to a sudden release of pressure. Then we have cylinders with products in them that are flammable and highly flammable, things such as hydrogen, which 
because of the static electricity, if it leaks out of that cylinder in a rapid flow, it will burn and you'll have an invisible flame, not a flame you can really see. So that's, that's a, a serious danger with a, with a hydrogen leak per se. Uh, you have products that are also flammable and heavy, heavier than air, such as propane, that if it should leak, settles low. And so areas where it's being used or stored, uh, precautions need to be taken accordingly for that. Um, oxidizing products, such as oxygen. Oxygen does not like oil and grease. You will have an explosive potential reaction if oil or grease comes in contact with oxygen. Also, nitrous oxide is a product used quite frequently in the, in the medical industry, uh, dental industry. And that is a two-hazard cylinder in that it's an oxidizer and it's also a non-flammable. Right. So oil and grease cannot be on your hands or in any way come in contact with, with that product too. Then we have reactive materials such as acetylene. Acetylene is a product that is pressurized into a cylinder at approximately 250 PSI and it's held together, stabilized in a base of acetone, a certain amount of acetone that is put into the cylinder at the time of fill. The cylinder itself has a porous solid filler in it, a monolithic filler as they call it, that holds that acetylene stable, okay? Then we also have asphyxiant gases, your inert gases, nitrogen, helium, uh, argon, and, and the concerns there, especially if you're using liquefied gases of those types, where a little bit of liquid makes a lot of vapor. Right. And the dangers of, of the potential uh, due to poor ventilation of someone being overcome by not enough oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, toxics and poisons, you'll find that you, those types of products used in the comp uh, chip making industry. Uh, you'll also find corrosive materials such as ammonia mm -hmm. that people need to be aware of the, the hazards of that corrosive uh, property. Another product to look at is cryogenic, which are refrigerated liquid cylinders in the industry. And they come with all products, uh, the primary products, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, uh, helium doers uh, that are used for uh, charging magnets in the MRI industry. Um, and they're large containers. They, they have specific cylinder carts, which we'll show you later in the presentation mm -hmm. here, um, that are used to carefully and properly move them. Uh, then there's also pyrophorics. You'll find that also uh, used in the computer chip industry. Uh, a pyrophoric is a product that reacts with air. Instantly, you have a flammability situation from the product being released into, the, into air. An example of that is silane. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much uh, an overview, Craig, of the, of the things to be just looked at in a general perspective. Well, thank you, Tom and Moy. I tell you, there's a lot of hazards associated with compressed gases from flammables to the cryogenic uh, materials that you were speaking about. Thank you. And we'll talk about that, too, as we get into the next phase yep. about the uh, Section Q. It's not just the hazards of the products themselves, right. but there's injuries that take place handling cylinders and cylinder handling and the use of the cylinder, yep. not just the hazard of the product. Yep. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, another objective during uh, the rulemaking that occurred a few years ago was to structure the actual rule as more of a, of, a, of, a, of a guidance document, too, where employers can actually use the rule itself as mainly an, a, a lesson plan. Uh, Gosh, that, that's true. That's a good point. Uh, when I came on board and started reading the federal rules, I started seeing two, three, four rules in the same paragraph. And even as a compliance officer trying to address an alleged violation, writing the proper language for it, when you've got multiple rules within the same paragraph, it was very difficult. And also, uh, Mike and I saw it can be difficult for the employer to understand exactly what they're required to do. So we basically wrote the rule where we state, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. Yeah. And in just uh, detailed sentences, yep that is very easy to follow and can be an effective yeah. training tool for the employer as well as an enforcement tool yeah. or consultative consultation tool, excuse me, uh, for Oregon OSHA employees, yeah. Yeah. compliance officers. So a good reminder to carefully look through those rules and know when you are under the you must and you must not <laughs> because right. there's a whole set of requirements under both you right. must, you must not. Right, right.
So Tom, I'll based on your years with Oregon OSHA inspecting various workplaces, how do you yourself approach uh, welding and cutting operation? What are some of the things that go through your mind initially to better evaluate mm -hmm. an employer's welding and cutting operation? Well, first off, before I even go out on an inspection, you want to do your homework. You want to read up on the company, what they do, what are the processes, and you can Google that information online and, and get some of that information so you'll know what basic questions you want to initially ask the employer. And then following the opening conference when that's completed, and I ask them generally about their business and how many employees they approximately have and what do they do here specifically. Then I'll ask, do you have welding and cutting processes here? And how much of your facility uses welding and cutting processes? There are some facilities, employers, that the entire facility right. is a welding and cutting operation. Right. For instance, I had, had inspected a, a facility that constructed your stainless steel tanks used for wine and beer and that kind of thing, uh, the fermenting tanks. Um, and there's welding going on all over the place in cutting operations. So I generally, after the opening conference, will ask questions of the employer about that. What am I going to see when I walk out into your facility? Where is it located, throughout or in a certain area? Um, and of course, when we ask them, am I wearing the right personal protective equipment? Right. You want to make sure you've got safety glasses on. Uh, There'll be, there'll be arcs being struck out there. The tendency of, of us as humans is when we hear that arc going, we turn our head and look at it. You want your safety glasses on to give you that ultraviolet protection, and hopefully the employer has that from their hazard assessment as a requirement for you to enter their facility. Uh, aside from that, after getting a description of what they do, the types of metals they work on, uh, because um, I, I want to know if they're working on stainless steel or not, and, and the issues maybe with hexavalent chromium exposures, uh, also the types of gases that they're using in their, in their welding and cutting processes. Uh, and then space is something I'll look at. But I, when I walk into the facility, I generally just stop to look. And, and just kind of take it all in. And look around and see what's going on. Also knowing, be aware, knowing that you don't want to, in the case of an arc flash, stare at that arc flash. Okay, um, And once I take that all in, uh, there's questions I might be asking my escort from the employer about the process as we're getting to the welding and cutting area. Right. And then making copious notes to make sure I'm noting if there's any tripping hazards. Or is it well arranged, positive notes right. that can be written that the employer took these steps and is doing this to avoid trip hazards. Uh, I hear ventilation running. I can see ventilation running. Oh, no, I see a lot of smoke collecting. What do, oh, boy. Okay. Uh, the noise factors, maybe there's, there's a lot of noise. Right. Because out of that inspection, there's what I'm competent to evaluate, and there's what our health compliance officers are more competent to evaluate. And so a referral can be noted, and information you want to collect for a potential referral about um, uh, ventilation, mm -hmm. or about uh, respirator use, right. or about HASCOM and SDSs and training. So, because that's something, I would recommend refer to those experts or health compliance officers. And I'm looking at those issues of maybe specific PPE, tripping hazards, um, the proper steps to be taken in the oxy fuel gas rules uh, that we outline. Great. And actually that provides a nice segue to the next topic I wanted to talk about is hazard communication. Obviously, Oregon OSHA's hazard communication standard is all about chemicals, and I look around and I see chemicals that are actually uh, trapped in these cylinders. Uh, when we look at compressed gases, we look at compressed gases and the products uh, captured in these cylinders as chemicals that can produce mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. a serious safety or health hazard. So, correct me if I'm wrong, when we look at compressed gases and the products that are contained in these cylinders, we're also thinking OSHA's hazard communication standard, labeling, SDSs. Is that correct? Exactly, right. Uh, they're a chemical. Um, and any chemicals in the workplace that employees are exposed to and use outside of household use or whatever would, mm -hmm. uh, those compressed gas cylinders, they need to have SDSs, data sheets. In their HAZCOM program, they need to be training the users of those, those gases the hazards of the product they're using. The sp whereas in the general training, that's not required, but for those specifically using those cylinder gases, they need to know the hazards of those gases. They need to know, is it flammable? Mm -hmm. Is it explosive? Etc. Um, is it something that could 
deplete oxygen in the atmosphere should there be a significant volume that could leak. Uh, yes, so, so those are questions that need to be asked. Plus there's materials that are, that are used that are not a part of the oxy-fuel gas rule, but there are welding rods that have flux coating on them. Yep. Uh, they could be using um, fluxes themselves. Right. Anti-spatter is used. Uh, those products give off vapors and right. that can be harmful and might cause the need for certain personal protective equipment to be used. So that's all should be taken into their hazard, commu their, uh, hazard communication written program and training. Very good. And I know one of the main components of HASCOM is labeling also, in addition to the SDS. And I'm looking around here, and I see labels on the collars of, of mm -hmm. these cylinders. Mm -hmm. The label, again, identifies the product that is in the cylinder, as well as the uh, diagram that I see there showing that it's an oxidizer or a flammable. So we're looking at a label also attached on these cylinders that mm -hmm. identify the product right. as well as the hazard. Right. And those are a, what is called a DOT label. It's required at, at a cylinder fill plant that when they charge a cylinder with pressure and with a product, they must label it accordingly. The label's got to be in excellent condition, legible, not defaced in any way. It'll have the specific name of the product on there, oxygen compressed, uh, nitrous oxide, USP if it's medical, United States Pharmacopeia. But it will have that on there. Then it will have the diamond, like you said, which has a color to it. Green being non-flammable, red being flammable, um, yellow being an oxidizer. Uh, nitrous oxide cylinders, for example, will have two diamonds on them because they're both an oxidizer and a non-flammable product. Um, and then there's a UN number on that label. That UN number, a United Nations number, goes to a hazardous materials response book for hazardous materials response teams, fire departments, that they look up that UN number, it identifies methods, methods to fight that fire or deal with that fire mm -hmm. that that product could cause. Um, and then there's general information in writing on the on the label too about right. things to be aware of um, about a product. Uh, so yeah, it's a detailed label that is required by the DOT to transport a cylinder over the highway yeah. and identify the product in the cylinder. Yeah. And by the way to mention too, cylinders are never identified by their color. Yes, industries will have colors. The medical industry likes oxygen to be green. It likes nitrous oxide to be blue. But that is not how you identify what's in the cylinder. You identify what's in the cylinder from the label. If the label's not legible and not readable, the cylinder should be removed from service and not used. And we talked earlier, speaking of cylinders, we talked earlier about acetylene specifically. And acetylene cylinders are different from most of the other compressed gas cylinders that we are around. What makes the acetylene cylinder a little bit different from the others? Okay. Well. As I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, an acetylene cylinder is a cylinder that is uh, comprised of a monolithic solid filler inside the walls of the cylinder. And it's very important that that is tight to the cylinder walls. And then at the top of the cylinder where the valve goes in, mm -hmm. fill plants will install what are called uh, felts. And they might put in a certain size felt or a number of felts, two or three, whatever, to make sure that opening at the top is solid to the monolithic filler. There's no gaps. And then they torque the valve into the cylinder accordingly and then go about the fill process. The danger with the monolithic filler and the acetylene cylinder over a compressed gas cylinder, standard compressed gas cylinder, is should it become severely dented, a very pointed, severe dent that causes that monolithic filler to pull away from the sidewall of the cylinder, okay. it creates what's called a void. And acetylene gas can rush to that void and when it does that, inside the cylinder, there's the potential for the sidewall to fail mm. and have an explosive reaction. So that's something employers need to be aware of, especially you might see this more out on construction sites yeah. where cylinders are out there and there's large pieces of equipment and the cylinders could be struck by that equipment. Yeah. The cylinders could fall from heights to the ground somehow or way, shape or form, and those dents get into the cylinder. And then at that point, a severe dent like that in a settling cylinder, you should notify the supplier yeah. and have the supplier come and pick up that cylinder and don't you handle or move that cylinder yourself because that handling and movement could cause that reaction to take place. And it just adds to the so. important, importance of inspecting the cylinders to ensure that we do not have any indentions or dents or even arc uh, evidence of arc damage to the sides of the cylinders right. also. Right, and that goes for cylinders right. in general. Right. When they're inspecting cylinders in general, not just acetylene cylinders, but you can find arc burns on acetylene cylinders. The 
anything can happen out there in the welding field, sure. welding and cutting field, where an arc has been struck on the sidewall of a cylinder. And when that happens, that intense heat causes little tiny cracks, if you were to look under a micro microscope, at that arc, arc burn, on, as we call it, on a cylinder. And those cracks then go out, and that cylinder now could potentially fail. And most likely, the more dangerous situation is at the fill plant. Right. So the fill plant operators of a fill plant company, right. when they're charging those cylinders, they do the same inspection before filling. But employers are to inspect cylinders, as we say, even in H of Division Two, outside of the fuel gas, oxy fuel gas rule, of pre-inspections of cylinders for damage, for right. arc burns, for fire damage, right. uh, rust, denting, severe dents, that type of thing. So just to remind the viewers that Oregon OSHA does have a separate rule on acetylene, and that rule applies when acetylene is used outside of a cutting or welding operation. So if acetylene is used, say, for jewelry making, or a plumber using just straight acetylene to warm pipes, Oregon OSHA found in Division II Subpart H, we have a specific rule for acetylene that does not fall under the scope of the oxy fuel rule. Normally we attach acetylene to oxy fuel cutting and welding, but there are occasions where acetylene is used outside of welding and cutting, and that's when that other Oregon OSHA rule applies. Right, and, and, and that's correct, because uh, again, when you're looking at a situation, looking at what rule to apply, the rule we're talking about here, oxy fuel gas, they have to be using oxygen, and a fuel gas. That could be acetylene, propane, or a propane mixed with a solvent, which, uh, uh, which is out there. Mm -hmm. But it must be in conjunction with oxygen and fuel gas. When it's that acetylene cylinder alone, you're going to look at the 2102 rule, yeah. which has written into it the same sections, basically, about transportation, right. handling, yep. storage, etc. Yeah. And for instance, in this case, which happened in Eugene, Oregon, where an acetylene cylinder, I believe, uh, became loose and fell in this van, and naturally this picture just depicts the start of the fire, but that, that van was totally engulfed in flame. The driver, fortunately, was not injured. Um, but in an enclosed van situation, transportation, that's yeah. in that 2102 right. also, so uh, to see the cylinders were properly secured for movement. Yeah. But uh, yeah. That's something you, uh, that needs to be assessed at the time of the inspection. And real quick, you have dropped the CGA reference a couple of times. CGA is the Compressed Gas Association, and they have uh, issued many what they refer to as pamphlets that offer guidelines for the safe use, handling, transportation, et cetera, et cetera, of compressed gases. What makes Oregon OSHA's standalone mm -hmm. acetylene rule unique is in addition to those set of requirements, Oregon OSHA staff can also enforce the requirements out of that compressed gas association pamphlet that's for correct. acetylene. And if memory serves, I believe that's CGA G1 right. for acetylene. Right. So Tom, let's talk a little bit about safely transporting Mm -hmm. Compressed mm -hmm. gas cylinders. Okay. Yeah, what comes to mind for me in transportation uh, immediately is securing the cylinder for movement. Um, there's so many bad things that can happen when the cylinder can shift or move when transported. For instance, that what I just showed with that acetylene cylinder that caught fire in the back of a van from displa being displaced and then resulting in a fire. Um, you also have cylinders that are many times transported laying down on their sides. They can be secured for movement side to side, but you also got to make sure in that scenario that they're secured for movement forward or back because there have been instances where someone has applied their brakes in a, in a very right. firm fashion and suddenly they find the cylinder passing their head <laughs> right through the windshield oh and out my. the other side and fortunately didn't hit them in the head. So. The cylinders become flying projectiles if not properly secured. And then on top of that, should the cylinder have its cap off, not properly capped, they must be capped if they can have a cap. As you look around here, you see all yeah. these caps on the top of the cylinders. Those cylinders have a threaded top to them which take a, a cap that screws on and should be screwed on accordingly tight and with the proper thread, fine thread, coarse thread to the same thread so they're not causing a problem that way. Uh, there are cylinders, small cylinders, that are not equipped to take a, a, a cylinder cap, mm -hmm. okay? 
Those in transportation should be placed in a way where they're protected from having heavy objects fall on the, on the cylinder valve, causing the cylinder valve to be damaged and the cylinder now to leak. So um, those are two quick things that, I, that, I, that, 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 that come to my mind, the securing and the capping of cylinders. Sure. The other thing in transportation that is important, and, we, and this took a lot of discussion when we wrote the rule um, to come to a final conclusion, and that was leak checking because there have been, across the globe, issues where cylinders have leaked inside the compartments of an Econoline-style van. Right. And just the ignition source from a turn signal has caused an explosion in that van because of the leaking acetylene or flammable gas that collected and was collecting back in the area where it was stored and a serious explosion. There have been explosions where the employee took the van home, parked it in his driveway, went in, had a good night's sleep, came out, hit his door unlocked, and boom, the van exploded. Bob. And that's happened uh, because of the buildup leakage of, of the flammable gas right. in the enclosed space. So there was a lot of discussion of how to see that the proper transportation is done right to avoid those scenarios. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we came to the conclusion, you'll see it in the, in the, in the rule, that you must leak check. Every time that cylinder has been removed from the van and is put back in the van, it's leak checked. When they get back to their portal at the end of the day and they're going to leave the cylinder in the van, if that's the company's practice, they need to leak check. And then they need to leak check again the next morning before they leave their portal to go out. Mm -hmm. And if they take that cylinder out of the van two, three times during their day, they must leak check it every time they put it back in the van. So those are the, those, and, and we came to that conclusion. We were talking about putting uh, cylinders in enclosed boxes with ventilation and other types of things, but that became cost prohibitive to sure. the employer, we felt. Sure. And so we went with the idea that if they're secured for movement, if they're away from flammable sources, also I want to mention if it's oxygen, it's stored away from any grease or oils. Many times in the back of a van, a maintenance guy will put his oxygen cylinder set and acetylene set in the van, and over in the other corner he's got quartz oil or whatever, yes. and oily rags. Well, you don't put the oxygen cylinder anywhere near that, okay? Because, uh, like I said earlier, oxygen and grease and oil don't have a good marriage, all right? can be explosive. So, but, and then, of course, the securing, the capping, if, if you can, protecting the valve, and leak checking, very important, um, are the things that come to mind. Very good. Thank you, Tom. There are many requirements in our rule when it comes to safely storing compressed gas cylinders. Can you speak to a few of those, please? Yeah, and, and quickly before I, I do get into that, Craig, I just want to mention that in that last discussion about uh, the transporting of mm -hmm. cylinders, I, I failed to mention that the, the person that's operating that van and handling those cylinders, no smoking. No smoking. He's got, and that even goes for, remember, flammable gases and oxygen. Right. Oxygen in those cylinders is 99.998 to 999 percent pure. What we breathe is 19 and a half to 23 and a half percent oxygen to support life below so. 19 whatever it, you're not going to do so well. So that oxygen is pure in the sense that it will if you have contamination of oxygen on your clothing and you haven't uh, in some way removed that from your clothing, which there's a process how you can do that, uh, or if the oxygen is being used, mm -hmm. it makes things burn very rapidly, very rapidly. So, so no smoking at all uh, in the transportation or the use of cylinders. Absolutely. Um, as far as storage is concerned. And we look around here and find all these cylinders stored and then we have all the other various workplaces out there. Right. Right, and we're here at a distribution facility for cylinder gases and uh, where these cylinders are filled at one of their fill plants mm -hmm. and then brought here and they distribute and handle them out into the field on their own trucks. Mm -hmm. We have an exclusion, a, a note in the rules that allows them not to have to change cylinders per se. So they might, everyone watching this video that sees these cylinders in the background and they're, they're there in storage and they're not chained, that's okay, all right? It's not okay at the user out in the field in construction or general industry. Right. They must, and they cannot nest, which is three points of contact. They need to properly chain the cylinders. And by the way, there is a directive that was written dealing with mm -hmm. the proper yes. 
storage securing of cylinders and talks about the placement of the chain, where should it be on the cylinder, right. there's diagrams. It's an excellent directive to become familiar with. And it actually splits out compressed gases in general, compressed gas cylinders used for oxy fuel, as right. well as acetylene cylinders. Yes. And that's Oregon OSHA's program directive A186, Good. securing compressed gas cylinders. Yeah. Yeah. But you were talking about a facility like this, right. and just because of their constant handling of the mm -hmm. cylinders, mm -hmm. filling the trucks and, right. Right. and coming right. and going, they have the allowance. During the writing of the rule, the advisor committee, where we had representatives from the cylinder industry on the committee, uh, recommended that, that that would be difficult for them to, to comply yeah. with and because of their expertise, the training and the handling that they, they're knowledgeable of, uh, yeah. we, we said fine, we wrote a note that they're outside the scope of having the chain per se, okay, or secure the cylinder. But there need to be a designated area for storage. Now that designated area could be outside, inside, okay. but there are limitations on the storage of products inside. For instance, propane, you cannot have more than 300 pounds of propane inside a building outside of the propane cylinders that are specifically in use. Right. We also look at that cylinder, whether full or empty, as full. Uh -huh. Okay? They might have them in, a, in, a, in storage and they got 10 empties here and 10 em fulls over here. Well, that's 20 cylinders. Yep. And the basic content of the cylinder, 33 pounds, is more than 300 pounds, and those would have to be taken outside the building to limit the storage of 300 pounds not to exceed. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so I look, you know, that the storage is designated, it doesn't exceed the quantities permitted. Yep. Um, also remember that users of the cylinders might have variable places they store cylinders throughout the facility, but it's important that everything about storage applies to one cylinder or 30 cylinders. Yep. They must be secured for movement. There must be separation from flammables and oxygen of at least 20 feet or a firewall five feet that extends at least another 18 inches above the tallest cylinder and 18 inches out from the outer row, okay, the proper storage. Um, and there must be signage, and this is something that's many times overlooked. The cylinder label is not signage. There must be signage above the cylinder storage area or at it that states the types of gases that are stored and also no smoking or smoking, if that applies, if there's flammable gases there, must be also posted in signage, okay? They should designate to what's full and what's empty. So those are the basic things that I look for when I, when I, when I see cylinder storage. Very good, very good. So moving from storage to handling these cylinders, these cylinders are awfully heavy uh, and they can be difficult to handle. What would be some of your points of passion, if you will, when it comes to the safe handling of compressed gas cylinders. In the handling of compressed gas cylinders, what's, what's very important for the end user uh, is a hand truck. And we have an example behind you of some hand trucks that are types of hand trucks that can be used for handling cylinders, where the cylinder can sit on a hand truck, it's protected from falling out to the side, it has chains to secure it from falling off the cart, mm -hmm. and uh, they make them where two cylinders can be moved or one cylinder can be moved on a cart. There's different manufacturers out there that make these carts that are available. The industry, when I was in it and as I left the industry, was going to, oh, for about five or six years, we had specifically only used carts. But prior to that, cylinder rolling was the way we moved cylinders. You, you, we trained people on how to take two cylinders in your hands, angle them out with their bottoms and with, whether they're right foot, tended or left foot tended, you kick the cylinder and you get up speed and you move those cylinders across the ground rolling those cylinders. But now, because of the danger that you could lose control and a cylinder falls and could strike someone, uh, the industry went to cylinder carts and they've now gone even from what we see here to palletization where they're putting cylinders on pallets and they're being handled by forklifts uh, and even customers are beginning to offload by palletization but still at their places of business they should not be rolling cylinders but a couple of feet to get them in a position to use the cylinder. Otherwise, cylinders are handled and moved on cylinder carts. All right, it's very, very important. Um, they have to watch out uh, how they hold on to a cylinder when they're moving a cylinder because the caps have holes in the caps and right. they're there for ventilation. But in the industry, employees have gotten their hands into those holes oh. and the cylinder has fallen 
and has resulted in serious cuts or amputations. Because they're naturally trying to... Right. It's a natural reaction of someone when you're handling a cylinder to reach and grab it if it starts to fall. And that's something you never want to do is reach and grab a falling cylinder because you could either result in a potential amputation, serious cut, serious back injury from grabbing that cylinder. Um, also in, in handling cylinders uh, under PPE, what does the employer require employees that are handling cylinders all the time where it could fall and hit them and strike them on the foot? Right. Do they require steel-toed shoes or steel-toed shoes with metatarsal guards to help protect the foot from a serious foot injury is another consideration for someone who's handling cylinders. Great, great, thank you. And we talked already earlier about HAZCOM, and you can't talk HAZCOM without talking about the elements of hazard communication, and that's all outlined in another OSHA standard. Well, here we have the world of personal protective equipment. So just a quick reminder, employers are required to do an assessment of the workplace to determine where personal protective equipment mm -hmm. is needed. Right. And when you look at the world of oxyfuel cutting and welding and the storage and handling of compressed gas cylinders, super important for the employer to have uh, fairly effective personal protective equipment hazard assessment done. Exactly, because you've got hazards to the face, eyes, yep. body, hands, yep. the proper Feet. gloves, refrigerated liquid. You're talking about something that's extremely cold, is going to cause a significant burn, and they have to wear the proper gloves to protect their skin. Yep. Um, and then their feet yep. from a struck by hazard by a falling cylinder, that type of a thing. Yeah, so there's, there definitely needs to be a hazard assessment done and, and look at, at the body from head to toe. Well, thank you, Tom. Maybe the most important appurtenance, if you will, when it comes to the use of compressed gas cylinders is the regulator. Can you tell us a little bit more about the purpose of the regulator and what you like to emphasize when you are inspecting the use of regulators on compressed gas cylinders? Yeah, on the use of regulators, number one, are they using a regulator? Because we don't use compressed gases in a free state. We're going to use these compressed gases under the use of a regulator. Uh, and in the case of oxygen fuel gas welding, they're going to have two regulators, one for oxygen mm -hmm. and one for the flammable gas. The oxygen regulator is something that absolutely positively can get no oil or grease or any kind of contaminant on the regulator, whether that comes from the employee's hands or anything else that could contaminate that regulator. Uh, the Compressed Gas Association that you talked about earlier has a CGA uh, fitting, and in the case of oxygen, a 540 fitting. And for the purposes of the camera, they can't see that, but there is a CGA 540 noted on the fitting. Okay. And, um, and this goes and screws right-handed onto the cylinder. Okay. okay. So that way, they cannot attach an acetylene regulator, which I have here, which you can see has a totally different fitting on it and it's left-handed thread too. So the CGA has designed that into all the equipment that it has those designated fittings. Can't screw uh, it up. The, the next thing to understand is this is the device that you turn clockwise, counterclockwise. Turning it uh, clockwise will cause the pressure from the diaphragm of the regulator, which is in here, to the torch handle to go up. Backing off, as we say, right. or turning the adjusting screw left will, what that does is it backs off so pressure is not going to be going per se other than what's in the system already to the torch. What's from here to the cylinder is isolated. Yep. Okay. Um, the other thing that's very important with an auction regulator, regulator, if this gauge should become defective and it gets removed and replaced, it must be replaced with a gauge that says use no oil or oxygen on it. Sometimes you'll see when you inspect this, and I see it, and I'm letting you know so you look for it, is I want to see that it says use no oil or oxygen on it, which if we did a close-up on it, it shows that, okay? The other side, this, this gauge, by the way, is for the pressure that's in your cylinder. So it tells the user right. if that cylinder's getting low and about to run out. This side of the regulator tells you, again, how much pressure you have directed to flow into the torch as far as the amount of oxygen, whether you want 20 PSI or 30 PSI or 40 PSI, uh, whatever is determined for the proper process that they're doing, okay? okay? So that's your oxygen regulator. Um, when they're hooking it to the cylinder, I just want to emphasize 
that if my cylinder is here and I'm going to hook this on and screw it on, I am not going to stand in front of the regulator. I will not stand behind the regulator. I will always stand to the side of the regulator favoring the side of the cylinder, okay, and, and attaching it accordingly. You never want to be in front of it. And why? Well, because oxygen traveling at a high rate of flow, which when you open a cylinder valve at 2200, 2400 PSI, and send that amount of pressure to this diaphragm, if there's dust particles, dirt, in that orifice of the valve, of the ox oxygen valve, excuse me, those particles will travel at a high rate of speed in an oxygen pure atmosphere and can cause an explosion. And that's where we have the term regulator burnout. What's probably happened is the operator has opened the cylinder valve on the oxygen cylinder very quickly instead of slowly. We always open cylinder valves slowly. They've opened it quickly and they did not inspect, clean, or crack the valve open to blow out any dirt or contamination prior to opening up the cylinder valve on the oxygen to the regulator. And that's something we allow. We allow cracking of oxygen valves strictly to blow any dirt, whatever, out of the orifice of the valve. And then after they do that, they can now connect this and then slowly open the cylinder valve to put pressure into the regulator with the adjusting screw backed off all the way. Right. And then they'll see a pressure on here as to what is in the cylinder. And then their next step is going to be to turn this adjusting screw in until they get their desired amount of pressure that they want to flow to the torch handle. That's the use of your, of your regulator. Um, the Acetylene regulator, which this is an example of an acetylene regulator. They color it red, which is nice, helps signifies flammable gas. Uh, the key thing here, uh, you, you're not going to crack, let me emphasize, you're never, you're not going to crack that acetylene valve open. There's 250 psi of pressure in a full acetylene cylinder, basically at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You crack that acetylene vapor to an open atmosphere. What did I talk about earlier about right. not being stable? Acetylene is not in a stable state exceeding 15 psi. You crack that valve open, you're sending 250 psi out that valve. So there's wow. a potential for a reaction in a fire. So you never crack that. You're going to connect this left-handed thread into the fitting of the acetylene cylinder. Mm -hmm. And then you're again, open the valve slowly. And we only open acetylene cylinder valves about one and a half turns. And part of that is to be able to quickly close it in the, in the situation of, a, of wanting to shut off the, the uh, product due to any kind of a hazard that's been created. Um, also leaks, potential leaks in the cylinder valve. So one and a half turns generally is what the operator should do. And then, again, the adjusting screw was backed out, so the pressure stays here and shows their amount of pressure in the cylinder. And then they're going to turn this in to the desired pressure they want to use, which with acetylene, on the regulator, this is imperative that this gauge, this gauge must have that red line which goes from 15 psi on up because you never turn this and bring that needle to point above 15 psi. And the reason being, acetylene above 15 psi is reactive and could, you could have an explosion. You can read up on it, Google it you'll find that basically at around 28 PSI, you will have an explosion. But in the case of, you know, 15 to 20, you could, and that's going to be a serious issue. And it should be addressed as a serious violation when that's found, if that's the case. Um, now, one thing that's always done with regulators in the system prior to actually using the system, Craig, is they must perform a leak check. And that leak check is performed by what we call a drop test. Now, that doesn't mean I drop the regulator. <laughs> I the, hope the, not. The regulator's attached to the cylinder, okay? <laughs> now, what a drop test is, is while I've got my pressure and I still have the adjusting screw backed out, I'm going to, on the oxygen, dial in how much oxygen, 20 PSI approximately is fine, right. on the gauge. I'm also going to dial in on the acetylene, right. oh, up to 10 PSI, but I, mean, I wouldn't push it up any higher than that. Right. That's sufficient. And then let that sit 
for about five minutes, three to five, at least three minutes, but we say in the rule specifically five minutes. So you have the system all the way to the torch pressurized for about five minutes. From the regulator to the torch okay. pressurized. And you're going to watch the needle to see if that needle drops. Okay. And that's where the term drop test comes in. If the needle drops, you've got a leak somewhere in your system. Yep. Okay? Now, the importance of the drop test is that when you do a leak check, you're going to leak check your connections to the regulator to the cylinder. Right. You're going to check uh, the regulator itself. You're going to check the connection of the hose to the regulator. Right. You're going to check the connection of the welding hose to the torch here and see if you get any bubbles. That's a quick, easy leak check that they can perform when they have the drop test says, whoops, you got a leak. Okay, the needle went down. So now once that proves to be not showing a leak, there's only one thing left to do. Your leak's in your hose. Yep. And you need to take and check your hose. If you've got 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, uh, probably the easier thing to do is replace the hose and leak yep. check the hose at a different time because that could be time consuming to find a leak in the hose. Right. But, uh, but performing that drop test, and that's something back in the beginning when we started this presentation, when you're talking about training to that operator, ask them what a drop test is. See if they go, huh? Yeah. Or they explain it. Right. And you will find a lot of them will be able to explain it to you. And then also you want to ask, how do they leak check? Because leak checking is something that has to be done right and done in a proper manner. Leak checking in the industry and with users, manufacturers, construction, they're using a soap solution with water. But if that soap is a grease or oil-based soap, which you'd have to look at the SDS on that material to see mm -hmm. if there's oil or any kind of grease compound in the soap, right. you just have got now a, a solution that when you leak check the oxygen cylinder, yeah. you have now contaminated that regulator, contaminated the cylinder, with oil or grease. And if enough of a buildup is there, there can be a reaction with oxygen and that grease. So how do you solve that problem? You use a leak detection fluid that is oxygen compatible. Okay. And as we've been provided here by Air Gas, this is an example of a product they sell, and there's other manufacturer right. products that are sold that are a leak tech solution that says right on it that it's approved for oxygen use, that it is grease free. It also has an SDS with it, so make sure they've got a control <laughs> safety data sheet for this. So the key point is compatibility. Compatibil a compatible compatibility. Leaks. And, and I always recommend to every user in welding shops and welding areas, yeah. be consistent. Yeah. If you've got oxygen that you have to leak check, use nothing but oxygen compatible leak detection fluid in your plant. Because if you mix the two, what are the chances yeah. somebody's going to grab what's convenient? Right and use something that's not compatible with oxygen. So have an oxygen compatible leak detection fluid. When you spray it onto the fitting and connections, it'll make, if it's a real minor leak, you'll get what we call a fuzzy. Little tiny bubbles that create this fuzzy look. You'll also get big bubbles. You can have, if it's a bad leak, you'll probably hear it, right. but it can actually blow the solution right back at you. Uh, good reason to have your safety glasses on when you're doing it. <laughs> um, but, Using the proper leak detection fluid is, is, is critical. Um, so that's a question, like I said, to ask, ask the operators. Right. Um, and I think that, that basically uh, you know, covers what, what they need to do. Thank you, Tom. One last mention on the regulator. I noticed that there's plastic covers over those mm -hmm. gauges, and I would imagine there's an important reason for those missing, uh, for those covers over the gauges. But what happens if we come across a uh, regulator that might be missing a cover or two. Yes, it's not uncommon. Out on an inspection, you'll walk up to the cylinder setup with the oxy acetylene cylinder on a cart with its hose, with its torch, and you take and stare at it, and all of a sudden you see nobody there using it or operating it, and the needle is pointing with positive pressure on the needle on the left gauge, whether that be the acetylene or the oxygen or both mm -hmm. in that condition. Uh, that's something you want to ask some questions about because the operator has left the system and left the system with pressure on it, and that's a hazard. Um, so you need to ask how long has it been in this state? Basically, have they met our definition of storage, uh, which is if these have been sitting for 24 hours in this condition, 
then they left it in storage with pressure on the regulator. If the person just stepped away to go to the bathroom or to get something or whatever it might be, even lunch, Short break. they're allowed to shut down at the controls on the torch handle, and that's, that's okay. But you're going to ask the reasons why and about the pressure. The next step is you're going to ask them to drain that pressure because we don't want to leave it. If they're not going to use it, let's take care of it. So you're going to ask the operator to drain that needle down to zero, which they should always do when they're done working. Every welder should be looking at their gauges to make sure when they drain the system, they did it, number one, and did it properly to move these needles to zero. Okay. okay? Now, also what you can find is when you ask them to drain the regulator, the needle doesn't move. And you find out when you're staring at it that this lens cover, which is basically a dust cover, right. is not there. You might even find one in the condition of this little regulator. Oh, that looks like an old unit. It's an old unit. We won't go into the details of what <laughs> it is and how it's used, but what I'm pointing out is there is no lens cover. Right. You've got damage to the actual internals pushed in. Yeah. And this needle is, is uh, uh, you know, pointing on the peg, but is it there because it's broken or it's there because it actually was drained and that's where that it works. So, you know, you can quickly look at that gauge and say, oh, there's damage there and the compliance officer writes it up as a defective gauge. Well, it might not be a defective gauge. Did you take the time to make that person drain it? Did the needle properly go to zero? So if the needle is still functioning and reading correctly, what's the hazard? Other than we have a lens cover missing, right. and it's it's what we call a damaged regulator, but it's not a defective regulator. Right. So we're gonna it would be looked at as an alleged violation, probably other than serious. They got to get the lens cover on there, take care of it. Yeah. If it was the needle and you can't properly read that gauge right. because of a defective needle, okay, now we have a defective piece of equipment, and especially with the acetylene where you can't exceed 15 psi. How does that operator know they're not above right. 15 PSI? And I'll tell you, from my experience, you'll run into a welder that's been in the business for 30 years, and he's going to say, I can adjust my, my adjustment knobs on my torch handle, and, and man, I look at that flame coming out, and I know exactly, I got about 9 PSI of acetylene, and I got 45 or 40 PSI of oxygen. So, but that's not correct. They don't know for sure. They need to be working from a functioning gauge. Yep. And if the gauge is defective and not going, that's a violation, an alleged violation. And if it's with acetylene, I'd especially look at it as a serious that's violation. serious in nature. Okay. Very good. So I hope that, I hope that gives some Absolutely. Light, a light on that situation, which I think is pretty frequent. Thank you, Tom. So we've talked training and evaluation. We've talked how to safely transport and handle and store these cylinders. We just finished talking about regulators. Now we're ready to use the compressed gas cylinders. Mm -hmm. What are a few pointers when it comes to the safe use of compressed gases? Yeah, and the use of compressed gases, again, this word comes up, secured. Yeah. They must be secured from movement, any cylinder that you're using. On your basic cylinder carts, there'll be a chain across those carts that they can chain them in their position to secure them. If they're out uh, near a workbench or something, they're not using a cart, they got to be secured somehow from, from movement. The other thing is they need to be upright. And we make the exception for acetylene is they just need to be valve end up as we call it. And that's because, and this is important, it's, it's not as much of a safety feature as it is the use of the equipment. The acetone in that acetylene cylinder, if that cylinder is laying down, there is the potential for that acetone to get into the valve and travel into the torch and yep. just gum up and shut down the welding process. So, that assembly cylinder needs to be valve end up to try to avoid that scenario of what is called a spitter. Yeah. Uh, that also can be created by the operator using too high a flow rate uh, and, there's, and they're drawing that acetylene out too fast. Right. And in books uh, such as this book here that uh, Victor's put together, and there's other manufacturers of welding equipment that have, I believe, books that talk about welding processes and cutting processes, tell you about the flow rates yeah. to avoid that scenario. But a flow rate that's too high can also cause that acetone spitter situation, which is not good. Um, but uh, drop test, 
We talked about that. Yeah. I won't go through it again, but they must perform that drop test as part of a leak check of the system. Right. And then if the drop test fails, they've got to do other things to find out where that leak is prior to using the cylinders. Okay. And then there's the shutdown procedures. And, the pr and as I talked about, pressure left on gauges. Right. With the proper shutdown procedure, you're not going to leave the pressure on the gauges. You're also not going to trap pressure between the end of the regulator connection and the cylinder valve. That short section distance will have all that pressure relieved. Right. If they shut down that system incorrectly, they can leave pressure there, and they don't want to. Okay. Um, so is this where Oregon OSHA's rule comes in handy with step-by-step, -step, yes. basically step-by-step -step procedures on how to safely shut down the system? Yeah, we have a step-by-step -step procedure that will go through specifically uh, what you shut down first, what you start, what you actually put pressure in first, oxygen or acetylene into the torque channel. What do you shut down first, the oxygen or the acetylene? Okay. Good. So yeah, that's a step-by-step -step procedure for that shutdown that we detail in the rule. Very good. A big portion of this oxyfuel uh, gas um, uh, welding or cutting operation is the hose or the hoses themselves. And it sure seems like hoses can take a brunt of damage in the workplace. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you look for on hoses, both the oxygen hose and the fuel gas hose? Well, first off, are they using the correct hoses? Uh, the industry will color code uh, oxygen hoses, a green color, the, uh, a reddish or orange color uh, is what you'll see with a flammable for the flammable product, the oxygen, um, excuse me, the acetylene or the, or the fuel gas cylinder, the propane or whatever. Um, and there's types of hoses. There's T and R hose. Uh, T hose is universal, can be used with acetylene and uh, uh, fuel gases mm -hmm. like propane or whatever. Uh, but the R hose is only usable with acetylene, being that the inner lining of that, of that hose uh, reacts with properties uh, in propane um, or propane uh, additive added so type cylinders that can degrade that hose from the inside oh, out. Okay. So uh, if they're using a fuel gas or propane or propane or a fuel gas mixture of propane and, and a solvent, they, they need to be using T hose only and not R hose. And these are marked right there on the hose? It's, that is written on the hose. The yeah. pressure rating of the hose is written on the hose. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's a good question to ask the welder or ask the uh, supervisor, uh, what type of hoses are you using? What type of hoses, though? See what they know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could say a lot for their training, too. Absolutely. If that Absolutely. was covered. Absolutely. And um, inspecting hoses, is it encouraged to actually not only take a close look at hoses, but maybe bend it slightly to look for any evidence of cracking or degradation? Yeah, well, hoses are, you know, hoses you'll find are, there's a short length of it being used from the the cylinders to the torch, but they got all these, could be 50 feet, 150 feet of hose wrapped up laying on the cylinder cart, okay? Or that hose is extended all the way across the floor. There could be, there might be a forklift that runs over that hose, there could be other issues that are causing that hose to be susceptible to damage. Right. You've also got damage that a hose can take because if there's slag from the welding and cutting process that's mm -hmm. flying and landing in places, it could land on the hose and burn the hose and damage the hose. Sure. So it's a very important prior to use, hoses are inspected, inspected possibly after use, um, and know your working conditions. What can damage a hose? What, what could be damaged? A way I also, especially with hose systems that are outside, uh, something that I do uh, is I look generally at the condition of the hose and and see that it generally looks in good condition. I don't see any marks from a weld uh, damage, uh, spatter getting on it, heat of any kind, or cuts or whatever. But I'll also take the hose and I'll bend it and do something like this. And a, a, hold, a hose that's old and starting to get very dry will get what I call granny cracks in it. And you'll have all these cracks running through the hose. Now, you could soap test it, which I would advise, see if it's leaking. If it's leaking, we have a hazard. If it's not leaking, we have something that could become a hazard over time and maybe we have a hazard letter and advise the employer that they should make sure yeah. they're fully inspecting their hoses to see the condition of the hoses because yeah. some of the hoses can be get, get quite old and yeah, been used yeah. for quite some time. So, so I look at that besides the general obvious stuff from, from being run over or weld slag, et cetera, like I right. mentioned earlier. And before we wrap up here, can you shed a little light on the importance of check valves and flashback arresters that are, uh, that are equipped on cutting torches. 
I remember way back when Oregon OSHA seemed to allow the use of one or the other, but during this recent rulemaking, that changed a little bit. Yeah, there was quite a discussion during the rulemaking on, on the use of that equipment. Um, they have a definite purpose. The check valve is exactly what it says. It's to prevent the backflow of pressure to the regulator and to the cylinder. Um, and that means, too, hopefully, that we're not getting uh, backflow contamination uh, of acetylene to the oxygen oh. side of the system, et cetera. Uh, but, but the proper backflow device. Then also the flashback arrester prevents a fire. If there should be a, a burn back or, or uh, uh, some type of a fire in the, in, that burns back in the torch handle, it mm -hmm. won't burn up the hose and to the regulator and possibly to the cylinder. And create a serious situation. So it actually quenches it a actually spark it that could come through. It quenches the spark. Right? Okay. Now, can they fail? Yes. Uh, from from different scenarios, should they be in checked? Should they be periodically replaced? Yes. Do we require them to be periodically replaced? No. We just require you follow manufacturer's recommendations. And for instance, in this Victor little guidebook, which is a handy little tool uh, that is out there that Victor provides. Um, they talk about the, the hoses the, uh, in it, R&T hose, but they also have a page that refers to their recommendations on flashback arresters and, and, and the use of check valves. And they, Victor, for instance, says, strongly recommends using reverse flow check valves on the torch handle if they are not already built into the torch, which I'll show in a second. Mm -hmm. They also say, we also recommend using external flashback arresters if the torch handle does not have internal ones fitted into it to prevent the flashback, okay? So that's all they need to do. Are they following? If they have Victor torches and you looked here and they tell you, yeah, we're following Victor's recommendations and they're good to go. Or another manufacturer, now, obviously, be, and there's others. They could be using, there's other manufacturers such as Smith, uh, Uniweld, Paris uh, manufacturer torches. This happens to be a Victor torch. And I know the camera cannot depict this, but I'll just describe that these right here at the end on the Victor torch are the check valves. We have flashback arresters here on each side, the oxygen and flammable side of the torch. Okay, Up here Victor on the torch handle has their manufacturer's name and they have what is called an F or a C or both. And you can quickly just look at that and it has a, a number, model number of the torch and it's got F and it's got C, which means it has flashbacks and check valves. Uh, they, Victor also makes them internally with just a check valve or just a flashback. So if you find they just have the one, now do they have the other externally mounted, which this is an example of an external flashback arrestor. One of these is for the auction side, one of these is for the flammable side. They also sell external check valves, which are a little smaller in size than this, that go on to the, in conjunction with these at the torch handle externally, okay? But they just have to follow manufacturer's recommendations, okay? And I'm not gonna go into details other than the fact that that's an important, that check valve is an important thing because when the use of those cylinders happens that the pressure gets so low in the oxygen before the acetylene is as low, you can get a back feed of acetylene feasibly back up to the oxygen cylinder that went empty. And when that cylinder returns to a cylinder fill plant, and that cylinder fill plant operator has been trained to do an odor test before they fill an oxygen cylinder where they're wafing and checking for the odor of acetylene or other contamination, because that could pose a serious problem on a fill manifold that they're pressurizing these cylinders if they've got acetylene contamination in it, and they're pressurizing that with oxygen, that could be a potential serious issue at that fill plant. Um, so we want to make sure that the employer knows that they're following manufacturer's recommendations. Very good. Say, while we have a couple of cylinders here, would you mind showing us real quickly, we talked about leak testing earlier, leak testing mm -hmm. around the valve assembly. Yeah, yeah, I went into detail how to leak check your connections at the regulator and onto the cylinder torch handle, but I did not cover and wanted to visually point to the proper areas that you should have the welder leak check for you when he talks about, when you ask the question, do the leak check your, your cylinders in the system? So what they want to do is this is your cylinder valve on an oxygen cylinder. 
So you have the hand wheel, you have underneath the hand wheel uh, from the opening and closing of the valve where leaks can happen. You have the orifice of the valve over here. You have the neck or where the cylinder valve goes into the cylinder. And you have the safety device. This is the device that will relieve in case of a fire or whatever to allow the pressure to escape the cylinder and not have the cylinder fail. So you want to leak check with that Snoop or uh, Radner product uh, here at the cylinder valve with it open. And you can also do it with it closed. You should be checking both ways. Uh, here, the safety nut and at the neck of the cylinder. On an acetylene cylinder, you're going to check the same thing around the hand wheel, the orifice, the neck here, but you're also going to check what are called the fuse plugs. These fuse plugs are designed to melt at 212 degrees Fahrenheit if there was a fire, uh, and, but they could be getting defective. It's happened where they will leak, so they should be checking the fuse plugs for bubbles and signs of a leak at the fuse plug. And by the way, something I didn't really uh, point out earlier too, when they're doing the actual uh, setup of their welding and cutting area, if they're going to be cutting above the cylinders, these cylinders need to be out and away from that because the slag that could come falling down, if it lands on these fuse plugs, it could melt them and cause a sudden leak and you could see with a full acetylene cylinder, it can have a flame that will burn up to 15 feet straight up in the air. Uh, Craig has an excellent video. Uh, in a car shop, yeah. uh, repair shop, where uh, slag was getting onto the acetylene cylinder, yep. and it shows an actual video of that scenario, not of the fire way up in the air, but of an actual leak right. that ignited and, uh, and melted the, f the fuse plug, I believe, on an acetylene cylinder, right? Yep. So, but that is very important in the leak check. And when they're putting those cylinders back in the van, leak checking, they need to be checking these to make sure that those different areas you don't find any fuzzies or any leaks. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out for everybody. Tom, we cannot thank you enough for the time that you have dedicated for us today, the expertise that you have shared. We wanted to uh, offer you a few more minutes to kind of indulge us maybe in some of those passion points that you have had over the years that you have shared with employers, employees, as well as fellow Oregon OSHA staff. Yeah, a few of those points, Craig, and I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to do this. Uh, First, I want to state confined spaces. When you see that scenario out there, it needs to be addressed. And, and I recommend addressing it through a health referral. I really think they have a little more knowledge, at least than I do, on, on the impact of a confined space. But that cylinders never mm -hmm. are put into a confined space to be utilized by anybody, along with the other precautions that must be taken as far as is the atmosphere the proper atmosphere with, a, with the proper oxygen, has it been monitored and tested, and is it monitored? The watch, hot work permits, all that process that goes on with confined spaces. Um, the second thing is crest by hazards with cylinders. Yeah. The industry, whether it's general industry or construction, there have been fatalities, broken bones. These cylinders are heavy. Some are very heavy and have fallen on them to employees and crushed employees and killed them. There was an incident back in the 90s up in Seattle where a six-pack of cylinders was, the employee was trying to move that and pushed it physically over and landed on him and killed him. Uh, liquid cylinders weigh 500 pounds plus. They fall on you, they're gonna break your bones in your leg. They're gonna cause severe injuries like that. So there are crushed by hazards. The proper use of cylinders up on, in construction on the second, third, fourth floor. Are they away from the edges and properly secured so a cylinder doesn't fall off that third floor and hit somebody down below? N different issues like that are even something as crazy as this little cap. What do they do with it? There's a spot on a cart to put it. That cart, that cap at the third floor gets knocked over the edge and comes down below and potentially strikes somebody. The weight of this cap, hard hat, even, with, not, even, yeah. even on the shoulder here, the injury that it falling that distance. Yeah could be a serious injury. Hard so those, those, are, those are things I've seen in the industry. Fire hazards, wow. You know, propane, uh, you see fire, fires erupt from the misuse of the, of the propane system, uh, both with leaks in the system, both with roofers that overheat areas and create fires in the structure from the misuse. Um, 
fire hazards from the flammable gases such as hydrogen that can create, be created and, and burns and, and, and things of that nature that can happen. Acetylene where the fuse plugs are not protected through the use of either uh, uh, what we call blankets right. that can be laid over the, the, uh, the cart to protect the hot slag from getting, as I said earlier, on the fuse plugs mm -hmm. um, and causing that kind of an issue and fire hazards. Uh, having a proper fire watch, the preparations that are going to be taken right. for a welding and cutting area with fire extinguishers and etc. Uh, the other area I want to talk about is explosions. You will have explosions. Unfortunately, when I was back in the industry, acetylene plants, it was not uncommon, and, and, and I'm talking about in terms of the 80s, the 90s, it was not uncommon across the country for there to be a major explosion at an acetylene plant. Now, we don't inspect that many, if any, acetylene plants recently. We only have maybe two or three acetylene plants in the Northwest. There's one here in Tualatin, Oregon. There's one, I think, still operative in Albany. And there's one out in the, well, it's actually not in Oregon, it's in Tri-Cities. So uh, that would not pertain into our jurisdiction. But uh, you got to remember, if you go into an acetylene plant to inspect it, you've got a plant that's going to have the acetylene cylinders and the flammable gases there. They're going to probably fill other flammables there. They might fill, uh, definitely fill propane at that site. Um, also remember, they're going to probably have a storage tank for acetone, right. which will either be an underground tank or an above ground tank, many times an underground tank. So those are things to be aware of. Uh, amputation hazards. Amputation hazards happen in the cylinder gas industry, the use of cylinders in the field. You've got the holes in the cap. When they're handling the cylinder, they, if they don't have bulk, you know, the proper glove on that can keep their finger from getting in these cap holes, it has happened where an employee reaching out to right. grab a cylinder has gotten their finger into a cap hole and amputated the tip or end of the finger. It happens. There are sharp edges many t on different liquid, cyl liquid cylinders have come out with labeling on them, and those labels hang from the, the valve area. And some of them can be very sharp. So make sure when you're asking questions, you know, how, are they wearing the proper gloves to protect their hands? Because if they reach out to grab that cylinder, should it be falling off a liquid cylinder cart, as you have right behind you there, Craig, um, and they try to reach and grab it, right. those sharp edges can cause amputations or serious cuts. Okay. Um, so the handling of cylinders can result in that. And finally, food carts. In that scenario, they're using propane cylinders. Right. And they, the setup of most of your food carts are the cart itself, the propane cylinders are right there either at the rear doors or right on the very end side of the cart, and then there's generally a generator there that's run during the time that cart is in use for power to operate things inside the cart. Well, two years ago in downtown Portland, which you can access a beautiful video on that, Craig, to show people. Uh, was a food cart fire where the employee was not appropriately trained to fill the generator with gasoline and went ahead and tried to fill that as was determined in the, in the investigation that I did uh, of that fire and the fire department. We agreed that he was filling that generator while it was hot, still hot, whether it just shut down and not had an opportunity to cool or actually running at the time. We actually think it was running. And a fire erupted at the generator. And that person panicked. The video, you'll probably sure. be able to see the gas can out in front and away from the area. But that fire then, the heat of that fire, then affected the safety devices, as I explained earlier, on the propane cylinders. And you right. also have a video of a big fire in Texas at a plant right. where the heat was so intense that right. it caused those safeties to relieve and ignite. Yeah. But that then caused the propane then ignited from that fire on the generator only about four feet away, I'm approximately remembering. And now you have a huge, sure. I mean a hot, very hot, large fire that happened. And in the video you'll see another explosion that takes place, which was I think one of the cylinders the bottom blew out and exploded and fragments of the cylinder went flying in the air across the parking lot. Unbelievable. It was a big fire. Right. It was very lucky that, that employees in the food cart weren't. There was another food cart immediately adjacent to that one that burned, totally burned up. It was very lucky that no employees were severely injured. 
very lucky that nobody in the public was severely, right. severely injured. But those food carts are out there. Portland, Oregon is known as the food cart capital of the world, I believe. And if there's one thing I hope to see <laughs> is that we have something we can do about that. Those generators and those propane cylinders need to be separated. If there's a fire with just that generator, we wouldn't have had the catastrophic situation that was there had there been the proper firewall or separation of those cylinders from that generator. So there are the rules that we have incorporated and written can be applied, hopefully down the road, to the food cart industry because I see it only growing yeah. more important. Sure. And probably food carts, they're a business, they're a small business, will eventually get onto our inspection list for comprehensive inspections. And it would be great to have something in place that would address the propane use, uh, storage, separation, and training. Because remember, it's a chemical. And there should be hazard communication yeah. programs sure. and training to the SDSs sure. on that propane with those employees that work in that food cart. So that those are basically my, my, my concerns that I, I, I want to part with to in, put in people's minds um, as they prepare to do inspections where there could be welding and cutting processes. Great advice. Well, Tom, when the day comes and you finally retire from Oregon OSHA, you will be sorely missed. Thank you so much for the time and expertise you shared today. Thank you, Craig. I just don't know how sorely that sorely will be. <laughs> but thank you very much. We will miss you. <laughs> well, thank you all. Obviously, for more information on occupational safety and health here in Oregon, visit Oregon OSHA's website at www.osha.oregon.gov. Of course, for employers out there, the assistance that employers can receive from their workers' comp carrier, along with other many fine consultants out there, and specifically when it comes to compressed gases, oxy-fuel related items, uh, no better source of information but the distributors, the suppliers who live and breathe and handle this stuff mm -hmm, every mm -hmm, day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>